Cool, but nothing. We're waiting just for the uh, technical things to be ready, and we'll start. My name is Amichai Bennett. Herzog Global. Did you say that we're going to start? Yes. Okay. We're going to start. 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 Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome. Welcome to people here in uh, <coughs> at Herzog College in Anon Shabud. Welcome to people watching us around the world. My name is Amichai Vanet. I'm the director of Herzog Global, which is Herzog College's arm around the world. Just like Herzog College knows how to uh, uh, train teachers and do professional development and educational materials all around the Jewish world. We do the same thing all around, the, they do it in Israel, we do it all around the Jewish world. Currently, our people are in Argentina right now doing similar things to what we're doing here today in a conference of 1,400 teachers in uh, Buenos Aires. Um, we're here in English and of course around the English-speaking world. We're also, we just signed this week an agreement to do a program of teacher training in Russian or Ukrainian depending who, what happens, and also working on French as well. And uh, we're here today uh, with our partners uh, for this conference today, the Lukstein Center at Bar-Ilan University, also the uh, Azrieli School uh, at Yeshiva University, and we're here, the, 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 the idea, the, uh, the fact that we're here live uh, to the entire world is thanks to our partnership with United, and I wanted to invite Asaf Gamzu, Director of Education of United, to say a couple of words to open, and then we'll introduce our speaker for, the, for this uh, first session. Uh, hi everyone, how are you? So happy and humbled to be here. Elad, are we good with the thing? Okay, wonderful. So hi everyone. Thank you, Amichai. Thank you, Herzog College. I'm Asaf Gamzer, Director of Education at United. Has everyone here heard? Has anyone here heard of United? Okay, so we have we have Beseda, We have a mixed uh, mixed crowd. United is a government initiative by the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs in combating anti-Semitism to strengthen Jewish formal education in the, in the diaspora. <coughs> we work all over the world, except for Russia and FSU, which have Chefziba. If you've heard of it. Cheftiba is a project of the Ministry of Education. Uh, 30 years ago, Rabbi Steinsatz was involved, involved in it, so we, we let them have, uh, have their wonderful organization. Um, I just want to say how happy I am that we were able to partnership with Herzog on this. In United, our mission, uh, we think is the core of our mission is to help teachers where they need it. And I think this day, the takes lessons and brings them into the classroom is one of those things that we know are so challenging. You have this wonderful class, it can be in university, it can be a Torah class, it can be on Zoom, it can be whatever, and say, oh my God, this is amazing, I have to teach this, and you get into the class, 20 kids are staring at you, <laughs> and you're thinking, uh, how am I gonna, gonna do this? So we're really happy to be able to hopefully help you and give you and us and any educator tools to bring to bring this, to bring the Torah and Tanakh into the classroom and with that I want to say thank you again and I hope you have a wonderful day thank you so much okay. thank you very much Asaf, so just to mention to the people that uh, perhaps will to the people that are perhaps going to be watching this the recording later because you know it's now 2am or so in the, in the most of the English speaking world um that we're going to have five sessions today, and if you, if you like this session, go to the Herzog Global uh, YouTube channel, and you can watch the rest of the sessions. Of course, if you're here today, you're going to be watching it live. And uh, with our first session, Rabbi Daniel Wolf is going to introduce uh, himself and also the session itself, but I just wanted to say that this, um, the course that Rabbi Wolf just gave, just finished giving online, is the first time that the Herzog uh, College's method, special method in teaching Tanakh was actually put into, into writing and into an academic course. So this session is, oh, was also born from that course. Lots of excitement and lots of opportunities to, uh, 
to watch it today. And the people here from the, uh, around the room came from all around the world. There's even uh, Rachel who made Aliyah especially to, uh, to attend this uh, day. We have, uh, we have uh, I, I just met for the, f- for the first time in person Rabbi Yerachmiel Garfield from Houston, Texas. I know his voice from his podcast, Chinuch Today. So, uh, so excited to see everybody, lots of teachers and lots of people and all the people watching us uh, live or recorded. Rabbi Daniel Wolf, Thank you. Okay, after all that uh, introduction, first of all, I'm also on, t- on uh, uh, 2 a.m. time since I just got back yesterday, so we'll see how that goes. Um, it has been a pleasure to be involved with Herzog for uh, a number of years, um, and as uh, Amichai mentioned, this most recently in a, a course that we're finishing, almost finished, haven't quite finished the grades, um, on uh, Tanakh, teaching Tanakh Herzog methodology. And I want to uh, relate to that, and it will certainly touch on some of the, the uh, elements that I mentioned in that course. Uh, but to do that, I want to give a particular uh, example, and we're going to walk through that process. To start off with, though, to give me a little sense of the audience, by a raise of hand or just a nod, how many of you teach Tanakh regularly? Okay. Uh, and how many of you who teach Tanakh regularly use content from Herzog? Or Hatanach Okay, good. And how many of those have struggled every once in a while with the question of, oh, this, and as Amichai mentioned, or as, uh, where's our other speaker? As Saf mentioned. Um, uh, how do I take that idea and then apply it to a classroom? Right? Uh, so that's, a, that's an issue that I guess I've been struggling with or thinking about since my Shana Aleph, since after my Shana Aleph, I did a very Shana Aleph type of thing and walked into the office of my formal high school principal and told him he, wasn't, he didn't really know how to teach Tanakh uh, in the school, as is exactly what you should do after Shana Aleph. Um, since that time, I've been thinking about how do we take Tanakh Herzog, at the time it was mainly Menachem Liebtag, but also uh, the other uh, Tanakh Herzog, and apply it in the classroom. And that is the, that's the framework, that's the problem, that's the premise from which all of this effort um, begins uh, and this process, which we've worked through, and I'll mention some of the people that I've been working with over the last couple of years, has led to some of these ideas and some of the direction. Okay, so I want to start with an example. Uh, and from this example, move to the question of application in the classroom, and along the way, teach a little bit about what I think is uh, Herzog methodology and why thinking about Herzog methodology is a useful tool for trying to apply it in the classroom. So let's start with uh, last week's Parsha, the story of B'nai Gad and B'nai Ruven at the end of Parsha Matot. Okay, so this is just a very, you have this on the source sheet also, a very basic overview of the story. Source sheets are in the back, Shalom has them. <clears throat> okay, we all know the story. B'nai God and B'nai Ruvain ask if they can have their portion of Eretz Yisrael uh, on the eastern bank, the area of Sichon and Og that were just conquered, right? And Moshe's reaction, and this is really sort of the key to the story when you're thinking about it, is Moshe gets very angry right away. Right away he sees this as a huge problem and he compares them to the Miraglin, right? That leads then to God and Reuven suggesting that they uh, will fight with B'nai Israel. They won't stay back. Moshe formulates this condition, right? And we get the rules of conditions from Moshe's formulation. They, of course, accept this condition. Moshe formulates a condition, and they accept the condition. We will um, follow up on that repetition a little bit later. And then Moshe gives them the land. Okay. So... Uh, That was weird. Uh, Okay. Um, If I want to then figure out how to teach this or how to understand this section, I go to Tanakh.com, right? I'm not going to navigate live. I just took a screenshot to save me some technical difficulty. But if I open up this, I open up to 
uh, Bamidbar Perk Lamed Bet, and then I click on the Mamarim section, I got a whole list of Mamarim. Of course, I went to Yeshiva here, so as soon as I see the name Soloveitchik, I get all excited. I click on that one, right? And I want to read this article from Harav Dr. Tamir Granod, who happens to be the Rosh Yeshiva of Orot Shaul, where my son went to Hezder. So everything's very exciting for me. I'm uh, very much anticipating what I'm going to learn in this, uh, in this shiur. And I come across this rather significant theory that Rav Tamir Granot mentions in this article, which is probably not his theory. I think it goes back to... Professor Elitzur, either the father and the son, or both of them, uh, and others have mentioned this theory. And this theory, uh, I, will exp- I will outline for you, or, or summarize for you now, and then we'll talk about the question of application. Okay, so, what is the theory? Well, he points out the most obvious issue, in, or one of the most obvious issues in our section, which is, that in the beginning, it is etc. Right? And then we get this description that we talked about. We have the, the, uh, the challenge of Moshe, and then the conditions back and forth, all with B'nai God and B'nai Ruvain. And then when we get to the end of the story, Pasuk Lamed Gimel, Vayitelem Moshe Livnei God Livnei Ruvain, all of the sudden, at the end of the parsha, seemingly from nowhere, chazi shevet minashe. They get the land also. They didn't ask for it. They didn't agree to the condition. They didn't do any of those things. And yet, all of a sudden, at the end, here they are, and they get the land of. Uh, uh, of Og Melech Habasha. So, here's the theory. The theory is that B'nai Menashe from the time period of Menashe, or maybe Menashe's children, had some hold on Eretz Yisrael during the time of when Yosef was the Shalit, when Yosef was ruling in Mitzrayim, his children or grandchildren, they would travel back to Eretz Yisrael, and they already had some hold on the land in different places, including the land that eventually became the land of Og Melech Abashan. And what was happening here was that they were getting this land back. They were not part of the whole request. This land, what was the land called? The land is called Gilad. Right? And that's a name, a family name in the Shevet of Menashe. So at the end of this section, at some level maybe not connected to the request of B'nai Ruvain and B'nai Gad, Moshe gives to Chatzi Shevet Menashe the land that at some level is rightfully theirs. Okay, this is the theory, one of these mind-blowing theories. Where did this come from? We'll talk about a few pieces of evidence that Rav Tamir brings in his article. Um, and that are referenced in other articles as well. And then we're going to, again, get to the question of how and maybe why I would want to teach this uh, in a classroom, uh, maybe in high school or middle school. Okay, so here is some of the evidence. Some of the evidence within the Parsha can be seen at the very end of the section. Because notice the difference between the way the Psukim describe the portion that B'nai Ruvain and B'nai God get and the way that so look in the Psukim. Listen, etc. But then look at Pasuk Lamatat. Vayelchu b'nei minach machir ben minashe gilada vayil kiduha vayoresh et amori asherba. And again Pasuk Mem Aleph, Viair ben minashe halach vayil kod et chavotem vayikratem chavot yair venova halach vayil kod et kenat. What happens? What's going on here? B'nei God and b'nei Ruvain, they took lands that were recently conquered from uh, Sichon and Og, and they rebuilt them and they settled there. But B'nai Menashe, 
B'nai Menashe conquered, and here, Rav Tamir points out, and we'll see where one of the sources he got this from in a second, they had already conquered the area. What do you mean they conquered? Moshe and B'nai Israel had a war with Sichon and Og, they conquered the whole area. No. The children of Menashe had already, on their own, conquered this part of Eretz Yisrael, and Moshe was simply giving it back to them, so to speak. Okay, now this uh, idea has uh, one other uh, interesting source found in Divrei Hayamim. Yes? I, I don't want to interrupt you. But you're going to. Can you go, that's true. Can you go back? <laughs> Bayil Kedua, you're saying, means, and they had. Bayil Chu means, you're going back in time. Bayil Chu they, means, they went sometime in the past. Is there any textual indication of that? Well, um, I'm going to skip that Maybe for now. Can you repeat the questions because the audience can... He asked whether uh, this... Whether uh, linguistically the, the verb form Vayilchu and Vayilkadua imply that it was in the distant past as opposed to, uh, as opposed to Vayivnu, which is in the same form, etc. You're essentially yeah. saying the text is out of order. Correct. Well, okay. So I'll, I'll show you the source for it. Okay? And then we will leave a little... I'm not going to get too deep into whether we can, we can uh, prove that. In any case, um, there's a, a set of psukim in Divrei Yamim Aleph. There's another set later on about B'nai Ephraim, which I'm not going to get into, but they're in the article from Ratzamir. You can check it out. Um, <coughs> but in Perak Ben, when it's just describing the children of, the children of Yaakov and their g- generations, Pasuk Chav Aleph says, V'yachar b'chetzron... El, that's, uh, this is in the family of Yehuda, El Bat Machir Avi Gilad, which is kind of an awkward formulation, the daughter of Machir, who was the son, who was the father of Gilad, Vahu Lekacha. So there's this intermarriage between Shevet Yehuda and Shevet Minashe. Okay? And then it says, Vahu Ben Shishim Shana, Vatel Do Etzkuv, U Skuv Olidat Yair, Vahilo Asrim Veshalosh Arim Be'eretz HaGilad. There's this, the, they have these, this is, again, at the t- talking about the time of the Avot, or the children of Yaakov, and it says that there's these cities in Gilad. And there's this perush, hamiyuchas l'talmid rasag, on this pasuk, that says the following. Umachir avimo haya rosh v'avli Gilad. Okay, so Machir, who was his grandfather, and Yair, who's the grandson, tafas li Gilad acharav. He, the, there the, the Gilad refers to the area. Yair, the grandson of Machir, captured the area of the Gilad. And this is the source. This all happened during the time period of, of Yosef. And they come back and they reconquer it. So here it is. The Talmud of the Rasag has, he explains this theory, right? That the area had already been conquered. And during the time of Moshe, after Moshe and all of Bnei Israel conquer Sichon and Og and the area of the Bashan and the area of the Gilad that used to belong to the children of Menashe, he gave it back to Menashe, and that's why Menashe is not part of the original request because it was kind of Muvan Melav. It was obvious that this land was connected to them and that they would get it back. Okay. Um, good. That is the theory. Pretty amazing theory. Pretty cool theory. It changes a couple of things we think about this parsha, and also about the relationship of that the Avot, or at least that the B'nai Yaakov, or the grandchildren had with Eretz Yisrael. A very interesting outlook on it. And now I ask the question, should I teach this, or would I want to teach this, to my, let's, for argument's sake, say, a ninth grade class. Like, why would I want, what, was, what would be the value, what would be the goal, or, at some level, what would be the process of sharing this theory? What do I get from sharing this theory? What's the value of it? So, uh, in order to explain that, 
uh, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about uh, some of my own background in education and curriculum design and with Herzog. So um, when I ask the question of should I teach this, well, one answer could be just, sure, why not? Sounds cool, right? So um, I studied, uh, well, I, I taught for a number of years in Cleveland in Fuchsia's Rafi school, High School, uh, in the school, not only in high school. And at the time, um, we were involved in this uh, curriculum development program, Understanding by Design. And the first, if you don't know anything about that book, or, 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 uh, or even if you don't really, under, really care about it that much, but if you even read it, then you know at the beginning there's this thing about apples. Right? And they describe how this teacher does this elaborate program about apples and has audio and visual and, and you know, activating learning for the entire classroom. And then at the end, the question is, why? Why are you teaching about apples? What's the point? Okay, so, and, and that question, which becomes sort of this understanding by design, quite, if you call something apples, it's a big insult. It's like, oh, you want to teach that lesson? That's just apples. Which means, why are you doing that? What's the point? What's the framework within which this idea would fit? Okay, so that's, the, that's this, this uh, question. And that, le uh, that leads to sort of the next step, um, which is the, the premise of this class, and to some degree the, the course that was referenced before that I just gave uh, in, online in Herzog, which is that uh, the attempt to try to define what we're calling Herzog methodology can give us a set of tools to kind of answer the question, is the thing that I'm talking about apples? Is it just some cool idea? Or does it fit? What does it mean that fit? What, what, what's the progression here? What's the context? What do I think is important about teaching Tanakh? And consequently, why should I spend my time and my students' time in teaching a wild and interesting theory like this? Right? What's the value of it? What am I trying to get at here? And that is the entry point into this discussion of Herzog methodology and how the understanding of the methodology can be a tool to application. Now, when I say Herzog methodology, what I mean is my own take on what Herzog methodology is or what, uh, what I find to be useful in thinking about its application. And as I talk about <coughs> these three pillars of Herzog methodology, um, I will uh, um, both credit and blame some other people. Um, I've worked for a number of years with uh, uh, Rav Dr. Shuki Rice, who's the head of the Tanakh department, and this discussion is uh, in very, mu very much an outgrowth of our many discussions over many years. And I'll also blame a little bit uh, Rav Dr. Uh, Sefi Marcos, who was involved in a number of those discussions and helped us formulate some of the labels. But I want to talk through a set of these labels now and how they help us uh, frame what Tanakh Herzog is um, uh, or what one way of thinking about Tanakh Herzog and consequently how we can apply it. Now, like anything else, um, and now I'm not talking about the methodology, I'm talking about Tanakh Herzog, right? It is both a very big chiddish, I think, at some level, um, and the existence of these Yemei Yun is at some level a testament to the innovation that is behind Herzog. And at some level, it is a very much an extension of ways in which people have studied Tanakh over many, many years. And as we think about sort of the, uh, the, uh, the, in the innovative side of it, we also want to balance that off in terms of uh, Herzog certainly actively promoting and uh, leaning into the fact that they are traditional in the way that they interpret the Tanakh. Okay, with that background, um, let's now get to the methodology part. Okay, Herzog methods. I will argue that there are three Herzog methods, or three primary Herzog methods. The relationship between the two and the one is a little bit complicated, and we'll talk about it later. They are literary reading, realia, and big picture thinking. Okay, I want to go through each of these uh, um, methods um, and apply it to our case, and then try to make the argument for what it would mean to try to use this story in the classroom, or how to use it in the classroom. And I want to start with, I think, the one that is the most classically Herzog, um, and again, not only Herzog, but Tanakh Eretz Yisrael, and that is Realia. Okay, so, um, 
The first association that I have, and I think many have, when we talk about Realia and Tanakh Herzog, is maps. Right? That is geography. To say you take the Tanakh and you put it on location. Not all, in part because you can actually go on location, and that's why from the very beginning, Tanakh Herzog and Yimei Yun always included Tulim. I see we have some veteran tour guides that, uh, that embody this Tanakh Herzog realia, Bashetach. You take your Tanakh, you go in the Shetach, you see where things are, and then you understand the Tanakh uh, in a different way. Now, what, what, again, I've, this is from the website. I just didn't want to navigate through it right now because getting to this picture is slightly complicated because you have to include the Prakim from Bamidbar through Yoshua so that you can get the, the, the breakdown of the Nachalot and also the cities that we're talking about. But if you want to understand, like, according to, right, the... Take our story and put it on the map. So this is the area that we're talking about, the area of Menashe. Menashe, of course, is split, and this is the other half. This is the area of the Gilad, the area of Ruvain. These are all the cities that we're talking about. And you could go through all of the details to understand uh, the geography, and I would add the word, the logistics of what happens in the story. And this is really the point that I want to make about what, what Tanakh Herzog does with realia. The map is one expression of what the realia outlook brings to the Tanakh. And that is the outlook which says, it has to make sense. What actually happened? And that I can ask those questions, and that I can in part, at least, answer those questions. And the way that I answer those questions includes not only what is written in the Tanakh, but also outside source, also obviously the map, geography, uh, but also other types of academic tools, etymology, and archaeology. All of those, th those things I bring to my reading of the Tanakh in order to answer the question, what happened? And how does understanding what happened illuminate the meaning of the text and the value of the text. And this is a pillar, I would say, of uh, Tanakh Herzog. Okay. So we've defined uh, what uh, uh, this first level of uh, Tanakh Herzog. And then I'd say, um, when it comes to uh, our question here, Right? And we'll talk a little bit in a, in a few minutes about literary reading and how significant that is. And obviously there's some literary questions here. But when I look at this question, there's at some level a literary question, well, where do they come? But there's a practical question here. What happened in the story? Where did B'nai Menashe come from? That is a, and, and the reason why I ask that question is because it has to make sense. And I always say that one of the biggest challenges I found in teaching especially middle school, but also high school students, is that they kind of grew up with this idea that the Tanakh is magic. And because the Tanakh is magic, I could say anything. And if I could say anything, it kind of doesn't matter. Sometimes there's a miracle. Sometimes there isn't a miracle. Whatever happens, is that the way the story ends? Okay, I guess that's the way the story ends. And to break through that and say, no, it needs to make sense. If the story doesn't make sense, you should be asking questions. And there's a, the logistics part of the story needs to make sense. It doesn't mean we always have the answer to that question. But if you're not asking that question, you don't really believe that it happened. You don't really believe that it could, that it could have happened in a way that makes sense. That is the reality outlook. It's not only the map. It's the question of what happened. And here, right, um, the question of B'nai Menashe came in the end of the story. Right? The question is, well, what happened? You could say, and apparently I think it's, now I'm going to forget which, which non-traditional version of the Tanakh it says this in, because uh, I read it in this uh, um, Professor Eli Tzu article, where it rewrites the whole story and it includes B'nai Menashe from the beginning. And that solves the problem because then they're involved from the whole beginning. But that's not the way it's written. Now you could come up with a literary theory, and we'll talk about that in a second. But on a practical use level, look, if they weren't involved in the beginning and they come in the end, there must be an answer. There must be a reason why they come in the end. That's the outlook that leads to the investigation and the idea that understanding the map can help us understand what's going on in the different cities. That leads us to this answer that there must be something else going on and, and, and then this theory of B'nai Menashe. So, if I summarize, yes? So, I noticed that you, 
you're asking how what happened in the yeah, or happened in history, illuminates the text. But is there room in the classroom to ask the flip side, like how does the text illuminate what happened in history? Well, I think the answer is yes. I'm not. Oh, okay. Uh, you're asking whether um, you use the text to understand history and not only history to understand the text. I mean, as adults, we learn both ways. But I'm saying as a teacher, right, in which, which direction do we choose to present it? You can present it in either direction. I'm asking your approach. So, uh, okay. Uh, briefly, I will say. Um, I think the way I understand the Tanakh and especially the, her, what, what I'm calling Herzog approach, it's understanding the historical background can allow you to understand the point of what the Tanakh is writing. Because the Tanakh, at some level, and this is, I think, the premise of this reality outlook, assumes that you kind of know what was going on. So, in, in, in particular, if you talk about understanding divrei nevuah, right, understanding the context within which they are talking helps you understand the point. And if you look at all of Tanakh at some level as prophetic interpretation, classic Menachem Lieb tag formulation, right, that it's, it's, not the, it's not the news section, it's the op-ed section, that assumes that you know the, the events of the day and you're interpreting them. So it's about interpretation um, as opposed to about facts on the ground. Okay, so uh, w we can follow up on that afterwards. So this is my summary. Right. What realia means, the way that I understand it, is does it make sense from a logistic, spatial, and also I'd add, we're not going to get into this too much, but human nature. Right? When I think about the motivation of characters in Tanakh, I also apply human nature to it. And I don't just think that they are acting in a kind of uh, angelic, uh, um, uh, angelic way. The other piece of this is bringing out some information, etymology, history, archaeology, etc. And then it, it leads to this explanation. Now, what's the critique or the challenge of this approach, it is it encapsulated in this debate, an internal debate within Herzog, Mashikara mo Mashikatuv. And one way, a couple of years ago, I attended this session, so it was within the last, I don't know, five, six years, um, there was actually a debate, um, Rav Yol Benun and Rav Yoni Grossman with Rav Amnon Bazak moderating, Mashikara mo Mashikatuv, and Rav Yol Benun generation one or minus one of uh, Herzog uh, Tanakh strongly represents Mashikara, what actually happened, Rav Medan as well, and then Rav Yoni Grossman, much more Mashikatuv. What's, what is this debate, Mashikara or Mashikatuv? It is the debate between realia versus literary reading. Do I care about what happened or do I care about the way the Tanakh says it? Obviously the answer is both. I care about both, but where's my emphasis? What's the critique of Mashikara? It can lead you to the point where you're, you're telling a whole story that's not in the Tanakh or not clearly in the Tanakh. And Rav Yol Benun can certainly do that. And Rav Magdan can do that in a fascinating and creative and mind-blowing kind of way. And when you try to you know, um, copy that, it doesn't always come out <laughs> quite the same. Um, and it just sounds like a little bit of a crazy theory. But in this case, you might say, no, Mashikara, maybe... Maybe this theory of B'nai Yosef makes sense, right? Maybe it actually happened, but is there enough evidence in the Tanakh for me to be comfortable in explaining this theory and sort of staking my claim, uh, my teaching behind this theory, and again, to what end? So, um, and maybe I'll, I'll mention this point. I have, a, I have this sense that I'm losing, I'm losing time. Um, I, one more point about realia, um, and this was a point that I, that I emphasized in the course that, that Shira was in, um, that even just the response to the way I said it before, when students think like, well, anything could happen, even just the response to that, which is to, to change that mindset and bring to the classroom, it has to make sense, to me that is worth the effort, worth a lot of effort, including getting into maps, and getting into logistics, and getting into history, and trying to bring archaeology to the classroom, even though that's a big effort, and can sometimes be a distraction from Masha Katuv. Overall, I would strongly encourage thinking about when you would bring that, uh, apply that in the classroom, because to change that mindset from Tanakh is magic, Tanakh doesn't need to make sense, to, no, no, this could have, this could have happened in this way, and it makes sense, that is worth it, and, and uh, that is a big value that you find in Herzog. And even when it sort of takes you away from the text, 
<coughs> I would encourage you to, to consider that. I know people usually make a tekkis of making a bracha, but I said a bracha at the beginning, just so that you know. Um, <coughs> okay. So let's move from this into the second method. That wasn't good. When you're teaching this, do you overtly say, we are doing the three aspects of the first method? Well, that's a great question. And since I taught for many years before I formulated the methods in this way. Sorry, no, just oh. Uh, the question was, do, would I explicitly refer to the methods in the classroom? So um, the answer in my experience is, well, I didn't because I didn't think about the methods in quite that way. But if you ask me now, I would say, of course, it depends. But my inclination would be yes. My inclination would be, what am I hiding? Like, I don't have a problem saying that, you know what, for, you know, we're going to do this unit. This unit's going to be heavy realia. We're going to really focus on the map. And, we're not, and I'd like to, what I'd like to do ideally is a distribution of these methods in a way that gives access to the students. And one of the things that uh, I would emphasize is that, and we'll get to this at the end, the more that students have access to the methods, right, the easier it is for them to understand and evaluate the evidence. So if I care about maps, I want them to have access to maps. I want to use Tanakh Herzog or any other map tool to say, OK, look on the map. What do you see? Does it make sense? Where was Barak in the battle? And where was Sisra? And can you figure out how this battle makes sense? And we're going to spend time outside of the text of the Tanakh in order to answer that question because it's valuable for understanding the meaning of the, of the story. Yes, sir. I guess part of it that I would look at it as a teacher is that I would Really, it makes sense if it fits into the big picture. Then you're not veering so far off, and if it fits into the larger yes, meeting, right. You know, you well, you took my course, so of course that's where I'm going with this. But, uh, but, but yes, meaning I, they they are integrated, and I don't. But like um, you know, any good deconstructive method, right? The the isolation of the elements is not meant to live independently on its own. It's meant to clarify and uh, highlight, right? Uh, uh, this is the vec it's the vector analogy, if that means anything to anybody, right? In order to understand a vector, you have to break it into its A and B components. A and B components are not meaningful on their own, but that without them, you can't do anything with a vector. If you didn't understand that, if you're not inter in into physics, just forget I said that completely. If you are, it's a great analogy. I think I first heard it from Rav Mordechai Sabato. Um, okay, uh, but yes, we are going to integrate them a little bit, but now we're trying to separate them. Moving on to um, the literary reading. Now, again, literary reading is not, it's not Herzog. It's not only Herzog. That's not what I mean. But it is applied in Herzog in a uh, very significant and interesting way. And as I mentioned before, it has become sort of the, the flag of, let's call it, the second generation uh, of Herzog teachers and Yoni Grossman primary among them. I want to, for this example, what I want to do, or for this method, what I want to do is explain it by taking a different article, <coughs> same section of Mamarim, and this is an article from Rav Amnon Bazak on the same section. Now here, it's, it's not the same theory, it's a different theory. I want to talk about what Rav Amnon Bazak says and how this is sort of a classic application of what, we, what I would call Herzog's literary method. So, we talked about the breakdown of this, of this unit and the different sections, and the obvious sort of lit literary um, sort of uh, flashing signal here, which is Moshe formulates the condition, Moshe formulates the condition. They accept the condition, they accept the condition. This repetition is just, you know, it's a jackpot for those of us interested in literary reading because it jumps right out. Why the repetition? And there's nothing better than repetition to get the juices flowing and think about what the point of this section is. So Rav Amnon Bazak just does as what he always does, a very thorough, complete job in explaining this uh, repetition. And that is to say, we have this repetition of the what Moshe said um, to in formulating the condition. So... Chaf through Chavtal, this time we're reading down, and Chavchet through Lama. So, first, in Pasuk Chaf, Vayomer Aliyah Moshe, Moshe speaks to Bnei God and Bnei Ruvain, and he says, Im tazun, 
אם תעשו את הדבר הזה, אם תחלצו לפני השם למלחמה, ויעבר לכם כל חלוץ את הירדן לפני השם עד הורישו את אויביו מפניו, ונכבשה הארץ לפני השם ואחר תשובו, ואיתם נקיים מהשם ומישראל, והייתה הארץ הזאת לכם לאחוזה לפני השם. ואם לא תעשו כן, הנה חטאתם להשם ודו חטאתכם אשר תמצא אתכם. So, First, he says, if you do this thing and you go in front of your brothers and you fight the, the, the battle and you help conquer the land, then you will be clean from this oath, right? And if not, you will have sinned to Hashem. And they, of course, accept this. And we skip those, we can even skip ahead to Pasuk Chavchet. After they have already agreed to the condition, Moshe turns and says, Vayitzav lahem Moshe, Who's Lahem? At Elazar Kohen, that Yeshua ben Nun, that Rashi Avot Hamato Livnei Yisrael, Vayom Moshe Lehem. Im Yavru Vnei Gad Vnei Ruven Itchem Et Ha'Yerdein Kol Chalutz La Melchama Livnei Hashem Vnich B'Shar Tzvi Tchem Un Tatem Lahem Et Ha'Aretz Agalad Lachuza Vim Lo Yavru Chalutzim Itchem Vnochazu B'Tochem Be'Eretz Kenan. Here, what's the condition? If they go, then they get Eretz Agilad. They get the land on the eastern border. And if they don't go, then they get, a, they get a portion like everybody else in Eretz Yisrael proper. Okay, now, is it a repetition? Well, yeah, but I could say, you know, it's not a huge repetition, right? Here he's talking to them directly. Here he's talking to who? To the leadership that's going to be in a position to implement this tonight, right? Because Moshe is going to die. And, and uh Elazar and Yoshua and Rosh Hashanah are the ones that are going to need to actually do this. So you could read it sequentially and say, first he gets their buy into the condition, and then he tells uh, the leadership how they're going <coughs> to excuse me, um, implement this condition. Now what's interesting is that in both, and I didn't bring this part, they accept both times, B'nai God and B'nai Ruva, and say, yes, yes, we agree, we're all in. What Rav Bazak does is he takes this repetition and he connects it, he connects it to the beginning of the section. He connects it to Moshe's initial problem with B'nai Gad and B'nai Ruvain's request. <coughs> because what does Moshe say in Psukim Vav and Zion? Vayomer Moshe, Livnei Gad v'livnei Ruvain, Ha'acheichem yavou la'milchama v'yatem teishvu po? What? Your brothers are going to fight and you're not? This, uh, this is a moral challenge. This is a challenge but to how could they abandon their brothers in their uh, obligation to conquer Eretz Yisrael. But he continues in Pasuk Zayin to say, How can you then pull a maraglim and, uh, um, and discourage them from conquering Nachalat Hashem, Nachalat Hashchina. So Rav Amnon Bazak claims that these are two separate claims. The first is a claim Ben Adam L'Chavero, and the second is a claim Ben Adam L'Mako. And if you look at the responses or the conditions that are meant to account for these different uh, problems, the second one is about Chatatem Lashem. It's about your obligation to Hashem. Your, your, your oath here is an oath to Hashem. If you fulfill the oath, you're Naki Me Hashem. And if you don't, Chatatem Lashem. But the, the other condition, which comes in the Psukim, this is, you read it like this, this comes afterwards, is about your obligation to your brothers and your place in the Nachala of Am Yisrael. And if you fulfill your condition, then you get to be part of the Nachala and get the Nachala that you want. And if not, then you're thrown in with everybody else. But it's your obligation, Ben Adam Lechavero, your obligation to the other Shvati. Now this is a classic example of a literary reading because he found an anomaly or a problem in the text. But he didn't stop there. He related it to the context of the unit and said that anomaly is enlightening about what's going on here and it solves another problem, which is this less obvious kind of repetition at the beginning when Moshe argues that they are doing something, there are two problems with their request. One is their problem of kind of rejecting Nachalat Hashem, and the other is their problem in abandoning their brothers. 
And this plays out throughout the entire section. And this, I would argue, is a big uh, part of what we mean by literary reading. So on the one hand, it's finding these patterns or anomalies within the text. How do you read carefully? You know, we, we use the word close reading a lot. Um, one of the things I hope you noticed in the, thing that, in the way that I just presented this, and this is a refrain that I come back to a lot uh, in my teaching, is that when I, when I teach especially students that aren't as comfortable with Hebrew, I want to break out of the mode of read, translate, read, translate, understand every word linearly. Because literary reading is often about the structure. And there are structural clues that I can understand and that students of almost any level can pick up on without knowing every word. And being able to understand that there's different ways to read and you can find literary clues throughout a section without getting stuck in the trap of reading and translating, right? to me that's a big value and benefit to the literary reading. In any case, part of what that assumes is that there's a unit, there's a context. And when I find this repetition, I put it within its context. And this is one of those where I started without even thinking with the breakdown of the chapter. And that's also a classic Herzog type of thing. And when you, <coughs> when you do that, you summarize the section, you summarize the section, and you also, you bound it. You give a sense of where's the beginning, where's the end, what are the pieces that I care about. And understanding when to do that with your students and when to let your students do that, that is a big part of giving access to what is the literary frame, and then what are the tools. This is just a quick example of some of the tools, finding parallels, um, and then tracing them back. Um, uh, and then, right, if you can define the relationship between the pieces of the unit, as we've done, and say, oh, there's a repetition here, but it goes back to the original claim, then that gives you this opportunity to formulate a reading. Now, this is kind of the key point in everything, which is that we're not just reading psukim, we're not just giving explanations, but we're trying to give a reading or a, 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 an explanation of what's going on that relates more broadly to the context and that, of course, takes us um, to the next section of big picture thinking, which is what is the context. I just want to make sure I didn't skip anything um, <coughs> in my haste here. Okay. All right, so before, but, uh, just before I move on to, the, uh, to big picture thinking, what, what, what we've done so far is uh, give examples of uh, what we mean by realia and what we mean by literary reading. Now, these examples were, are meant, in this case, to help us ask the question, what am I trying to accomplish right, by, let's say, bringing Rav Tamir's theory into the classroom. Can I frame it in a way that makes sense within the context of what I'm trying to do as a teacher? Now that implies uh, and assumes a whole bunch of things about what I'm trying to get at, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about those, but at least I can say, right, I can make the argument, right, that um, if I care about a realia outlook and I want to answer the question, what happened, and I want to focus on the map, I could, I could make the claim that using this theory of B'nai Menashe will help me get there at some level. Alternatively, I might say, and part of what I want to show there is that you contrast that with the Rav Bazak reading, you might say, look, that is much more local. It's much more anchored in the text of this particular section. And it's much, more, it's much easier for me to say, look, if I want to focus on this section and not get too far afield, I have very clear evidence, which is a, a, a word I'm going to come back to a lot. Um, the evidence is in the psukim right here. I can think about ways in which I can guide my students to identifying that evidence so that I can formulate a, a, re, a literary reading of this unit that makes sense and is accessible to them. Right? And those are the things that I'm going to come back to. I've given away the end at some level. But what's the evidence? Uh, is it accessible? And then is, is it relevant? So all of this leads to this third, this third method, big picture thinking. Now, I don't know whether these three things are really at the same level. Because big picture thinking is a very general kind of statement um, and uh, can be applied in all sorts of, all sorts of different ways. And yet, I think, I'm still pretty convinced 
um, that it is what it is a distinct aspect of Herzog methodology. Because what it says is, and the way I want to say it is, what is your context? Where are you placing this story? Okay? And if you can't answer the question of what is your context, then you can that, you can, then it's much harder to answer the question of whether any of the details are relevant to that context. Okay? Um, so, uh, I'm not going to get caught in that example. Um, I think the basic context within which, certainly when I think about my original exposure to Herzog thinking um, and the way that I try to teach it, is this primary context is the safer. Okay? Now, this is not a, uh, again, this is not a Chiddush of Herzog, right? The Ramban wrote introduction in his commentary on the Torah, writes introductions to each Sefer. Why does he write introductions to each Sefer? Or what does he demonstrate in his introduction to each Sefer? That the Sefer has a certain coherence to it, a certain theme, a certain arc. That's kind of a big statement. It says it needs to hold together. And when you think about the Tanakh in, the way, in that way, it changes your expectations about each piece of that Sefer. Because the primary question that I would often ask is, well, why is this section in the book? Why is it in the Sefer? What does it add to that arc of the Sefer? Do I have a sense of what the Sefer is trying to do? And consequently, can I then understand what this piece is and why it's in the Sefer? Now, this changes, to some degree, the outlook that I have on any unit that I might teach. Because it always, it sort of puts me in a position to ask and answer the question, for what end? What am I trying to get at here? And if I can think about the whole or the book in a particular way, then I'm in a position to answer the question, well, why is, why, why is, this, uh, why is this piece important? Okay, to demonstrate that part of big picture thinking, I'm, I'm Dafka going to go to maybe <coughs> the uh, primary uh, exemplar of literary reading, but uh, also big picture thinking, uh, Professor Yoni Gross. Okay, so, um, what's my time here? Okay, I'm running out of time. Good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this quickly and not go into all the details I'm going to summarize his evidence um, and, uh, and explain his theory. Okay. Yoni Grossman takes a look at this story of B'nai God and B'nai Ruvain, and he says the key to understanding this story is understanding the role of Minashe in Sefer Bamidbar, and the end of Sefer Bamidbar in particular. Because Minashe has a very particular, unique role, and they represent... Okay? And his argument, well, the, the first one comes chronologically first, but we'll save it for the end. Okay? If you notice, there are three examples in the end of Sefer Bamidbar, which focuses on a number of different elements, primarily preparation for Knisa Aretz. Okay? Um, and in that preparation for Knisa Aretz, that includes the counting. And the counting, that sentence is Le'ele Techaleka Ta'aretz Where you're going to divide up the land to these people that we've counted. And once that's been established, there are three examples of initiative from the people regarding their Nachala. And all of those examples are from B'nai Menashe. Now two are very tightly uh, connected and this, that article from Yoni Grossman is actually on the very last chapter in... Uh, in, in Sefer Bamidbar about B'nai Menashe's request of what can we do about the possibility that we would lose some of our Nachala to when B'not, if B'not Slovchad were to marry outside of our Shevet. But that, of course, is connected to the initial, initial request of B'not Slovchad, which is to say, wait a second, we want, we want land. They are B'not Slovchad, the descendants of Menashe, who, oh, who take initiative and ask to be included in the Nachala. And then the rest of their brethren in their shevet say, that's great. It's great that um, B'not Slavchad get this nachala, but we're a little worried about what this means for the rest of our shevet. And Moshe comes up with this uh, conclusion. Interesting, in this, 
In this request, Moshe asks Hashem. In this request, he just gives an answer. And of course, in this one, well, not with Menashe, but with Bnei Gad and Reuven, he gets angry. So Moshe's reaction to the different initiatives is, is quite different. We might get a chance to come back to that. In any case, what we're saying is that the story of Benot Slavchad, which sort of anchors this end of Sefer Bamidbar and concludes the book, and this is part of Yoni Grossman's argument, that the reason why it concludes the book, because Benay Menashe epitomized what it means to be Chovavei Haaretz, and their request was in its entirely based on their desire to... Uh, uh, co- to inherit the land, their love of the land, and their interest in maintaining the nachala of their, of their uh, shevet. And that was the request of Slavchad, and it was the request of the Bnei Menashe to get it. And then he would add, well, in that context, then Bnei Menashe, even if they were involved in the be- initial request, which, as I mentioned, was uh, a reading from one of the uh, alternative versions of the Tanakh, and something that, in that article, Yoni Grossman says in the name of Rav Yol Benun that he argues that from the beginning, Bnei Menashe were part of the request. It's just that Moshe didn't get angry at them. And why didn't Moshe get angry at them? <coughs> because it's very clear from the whole context of the end of Sefer Bamidbar that their intentions are to inherit the land and not the suspicion that Moshe has of Bnei Gad and Bnei Ruvain that... Um, they are somehow undermining the conquest of the land or not uh, taking responsibility for the, uh, their role in the collective of, uh, of Amishu. So now, how is this sort of a big picture combo? It's a combo reading, right? Big picture literary reading because it's saying, we know there's a problem in, in, in our story. The, story. the problem is that B'nai Manasher are not mentioned until the end. But the answer from this reading of uh, Professor Grossman is that, but if you understand the context of the end of Sefer Bamidbar, then yes, it's missing from that particular story, but it's not missing from the whole book. Because the context of the book, the context of B'nai Minashe, tells me, oh, B'nai Minashe getting land at the end, well, obviously we know that they're not a problem, they don't need a condition because their intentions are good, and they've demonstrated that, have or will demonstrate that in other areas in the book. Rav Yol Benun argues that part of why they weren't a problem is because they're chetzi. It's half. And that naturally links them in both of Rav Bazak's level, both the uh, connection to Nachalat Hashem because they have a Nachalat in Eretz Yisrael proper, and in their commitment to their brothers because it's their actual shave that they're even more committed. In any case, what we're saying is that by defining your context, in this case it's not even all of Sefer Bamid Bar, it's the end of Sefer Bamidbar. You now are in a position to justify or explain whether this evidence kind of is good, so to speak. So Ravina Grossman points out this, this uh, anomaly also. Right? We know that the biggest change, other than Shimon, Shimon drops an amazing amount from the count at the beginning of Sefer Bamidbar to the count in Parshat Pinchas, and Menashe jumps. Right? And we all know that the Midrash says that that's because of Shimon's involvement in Baal Pahor, so kind of a punishment. So Rav Bazak says, uh, no, I'm, now I'm confusing my... Rav, Rav Yoni Grossman says right, that I could say the other way also, that if Minashe jumps in numbers, then that could be a kind of reward. And what's the reward for? Well, what's the evidence in the book? Because of their demonstrated commitment to Nachalat Haaretz. And that fits very well with what's going on at the end of Sefer Bamid. <coughs> okay, now, I mentioned that this is uh, the idea of big picture. Uh, can be described in different ways. And this basic element of big picture thinking, I, or this classic mode that I think is, um, again, uh, experientially is the one I think I first encountered, is this focus on the book. In this case, 
half the book or the end of the book. Uh, you could relate it to the rest of Sefer Bamidbar. I think I'm not going to fall into that trap and try to do that now. But this is uh, the way he describes the end of the book. But when you think about context or big picture, you don't need to stop there, right? And, and you could think about big picture of the Tanakh. Maybe even beyond that, but think about big picture of Tanakh. What would it mean to connect this story of Bnei Menashe to other examples throughout the Tanakh? And again, if you go through some of those other articles on Tanakh.com, you'll find some of these examples. One connects it back to the war uh, that Avram had with the four kings in this same area. Okay? Um, and the, the argument that Avraham conquered all of the eastern side of the Jordan and gave it to his children, Ammon, Moab, Edom, because they, they, that's their right to that land. And then what happened to the area of Og? That's something that Rav Tamir relates to in his article. But you could connect that back to that story and that initial conquest, which I said, right? We, we saw the, the theory that that started in the time of the children of Yosef, but it goes back to Avram also. Um, and Yoni Grossman does connect this a little bit to the brachot to Ephraim and Menashe. Right? What Menashe actually at this point is large and kind of double and kind of the Bechor, even though Yaakov promises it to Ephraim, and that plays out only later, later on with, uh, with Yoshua and after Kibush Aretz. The conquest of Sichon and Og and this area, which is mentioned in Parshat Chukat, and then referred back to here, and then reviewed in kind of great detail in, in Parshat Dvarim, understanding the context of how those different parshiot relate to this land, that's also right, relevant here. And then, um, you know, this key element uh, of, of the story, which is, well, how does it play out? They made this promise, they made this commitment, Yoshua Parakalov explicitly refers back to this commitment, and here we no longer have a distinction between Menashe and Reuven and God. They're grouped together. They come to Yoshua. They say, we will follow you like we followed uh, Moshe. And then in the end, it talks about how they fulfill their promise and they're released from their vow, as was um, uh, <coughs> anticipated by Moshe. Uh, but then we have the story of the Mizbeach, where they build this Mizbeach uh, at the border probably in on the Eretz Yisrael side, and then um, uh, the rest of the Shvatim get very angry, and it leads almost to a civil war, and is kind of a, uh, a precursor to the, the, uh, the civil war in the time of Peleg Shbegivad. This story, which is anchored in our story, of course, and how you might want to play that out, and of course, Devarim, we talked about the Psukim in, in Perak Bet, that refer to... Um, uh, Machir, and then in Perak Zion it also refers to Ephraim and Bnei Yisrael. Why, why, why am I saying this? Well, one of the things that happens very often in a Herzog class is you go on a little tool of the Tanakh, right? You start in one book or one Pasuk and then you end up in Divrei Hayamim and you end up here. Well, that's because, or my explanation for that, what's the methodology? That there's one story that's the whole Tanakh and it, it, it teaches about itself in all sorts of different ways. Now, that context is pretty significant. What's your big picture? Are you trying to teach Tanakh? Are you trying to teach Sefer Bamidbar? Are you trying to teach Parshot, Parshot, Parshat Matot? Are you trying to teach just this story? The way in which you define your context and explain that to, the stu to your students is a significant uh, justification for the type of background and evidence that you will bring and the type of ideas or Tanakh content that you will bring. So, if you don't ever relate to that biggest of big pictures in your class, and then you refer to a pasuk in Devrei Hayamim to answer a local question, your students should rightfully be a little bit confused. But if all along you've been building towards that, then it's a different type of question. And this is really... Um, uh, okay, so I'll summarize big picture and then I'll try to uh, bring this home. I have till 1040, is that it? Okay. Uh, so, big picture, again, one way of thinking about it is message of the book. The other is sort of broadly, broadly speaking patterns in the Tanakh. And then assumptions and messages. I have a lot to say about that, but I'm going to leave that for now because it will just be 
uh, confusing to me. Okay, so um, I'll get this out here, and then I'm going to use the last four minutes to throw some other things in. Okay, this is, this is it. This is my answer to the question, can you apply it in the classroom? Of course you can. All you have to do is this. Find an idea, identify the methods, because part of what I'm saying in the methods is if you can tease those out on your own, if you can tease out, oh, I see what uh, Rav Amnon Bazak did, then I have a tool to more clearly apply it. Clarify the accessibility of the evidence. And this is what I mean. Right? So we saw different types of evidence. We saw a Pusuk here, a Pusuk there. We saw a parallel um, from Rav Amnon Bazak. We saw maps. My, my charge to, uh, uh, to teachers is to say, if you can, it's one thing if you can explain it to your students. It's another thing is you can give them access to the tools so that they can build that evidence. Now, they don't have to build it all on their own, right? They're not going to come up. Part of the challenge in saying going to use a Herzog idea is that, for the most part, you didn't come up with it on your own, and your students aren't going to come up with it on their own either. That's not the point. The point is for them to be inspired or excited by the possibility of what it means to explain the Tanakh. You can and you should do that but only when there's a certain accessibility of evidence. And that's what I'm trying to say. Can you establish the context within which this evidence is meaningful? So if I've never looked at a map, and then I bring, and it doesn't mean there's, you can never start with maps. You can start with maps. But if it's just to bring an answer to one idea, that's not going to go anywhere. But if you've been building the idea that realia matters, that the story needs to make sense, and this is a map, and this is extra evidence, now I'm in a position for my students to be along for the ride. This, of course, is the biggest problem, right? I was very excited by a, by a Herzog idea, and I brought it in the classroom, and the students are, okay, whatever, or writing it down, and then they spit it back on the test, and you're like, shoot, I just ruined it, because now when they go to yeshiva, and they hear Dr. Yael Ziegler give this class, they're going to say, oh, I think I sort of heard that before, and they're going to have missed it the first time, and they're going to not appreciate it the second time, right? Then you've killed it, right? But if you set it up more carefully, and you figure, okay, I'm going to have to hold back, I'm not going to give that idea, but I'm going to do some of the background work, then they're in a position to understand. That's accessibility of evidence. And then the other, the last part that I'll, that are, the, the, the label that I'll say here is the relevance of the idea for your context. What do I mean by relevance? I mean the big picture. What have you established in your school, in your classroom, in your own teaching of this particular unit? What have you established as meaningful and relevant, right? So that the theory of B'nai Menashe conquering uh, the Eretz HaGilad and HaBashan during the time of Yosef is that relevant for this classroom? Well, it really could be. There's a story in which that is a very relevant theory because they see the problem in the text and we've already talked about the context of this book. Maybe we've talked about B'nai Menashe and we've already mentioned this eastern side of the, of the Yardane and we've talked about maybe back to Avraham but at least during the concept of Sichon and Og how, the, how Ammon and Moab and the relationship between those nations and Am Yisrael and how that's a little bit fraught but it goes back to Avraham. Right? If I've done that work then okay this answer fits. It's relevant. And then if I can give them tools like at Tanakh.com to look at the website and other, uh, other searching tools which we're not going to get into now so that you can demonstrate the evidence of what, ha of what leads to the theory then you can and you should uh, apply uh, Tanakh Herzog in your classroom. I hope this gives you a sense of how to do it, even though, of course, there's a lot more. Thank you. <laughs> yes? From my perspective, you can. I just don't want to hold anyone back from their next class. Um, what do you think about the idea of, you will just pass the microphone to you? Possible? What, what do you think about the idea of pulling it into a, a, a modern map? I, I know that on the Herzog <laughs> website you actually have the ability to do that. But it's like, do our students know that parts of the area of B'nai Menashe actually is in Israel's hands today as opposed to Reuven and God? That's so that's not? the end of Tamir's article because he relates it to the Grizz's position that uh, the Golan is part of Eretz Yisrael for Chulun and Masar and things like that. So, yes, of course, yes. Um, um, the first time that I was in this uh, uh, 
a session in the Yumei Yun about maps, uh, maps on Herzog, I showed <coughs> Shuki Rice how if you click in the Google button on the bottom, then it takes you to the regular map, and then you can, then you can see, uh, in, the, in the one on Herzog, you can also see the modern day cities. But yes, of course, you talk about, we, we did this, he, he did this thing about um, Melachim Aleph, Perak Aleph, and Adoniyahu, right, that was in the class. If you put it on the map, you can actually walk it, and you can see how long it takes to walk. So yes, definitely. Uh, they, have they have the bicycle. They have the car. That is a great add-on. I'm sure you could do that. That's perfect. That's so good. They need a donkey. Is it the same rate? Supposedly he rode once from Hebron to Shalayim on his bicycle, and that that way he could estimate. All right, that's good to know. Who did that? Oh yeah, oh, that's per so perfect. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's true. That's totally. That's totally perfect. I also had a question about yeah. your reality, realia, whatever. Yeah. That the the Tamir article. So I don't know. In the eyes, speaking of traveling, right. you know, by donkey, if they were in Mitzrayim to go all the way up to the Bashan, right? You think? I mean, it's not that. First of all, they don't. They wouldn't have traveled the route of. Right. Of uh, they, they would have gone. Okay. Daryl Harris, please, team. It's a couple. I mean, we know that they traveled to Bar Yaakov. Like. I think the travel there, on the one end, it's like so long because there's no car. Right. And then it's like, okay, it's a month, it's three weeks. Like, if they're traveling back and forth, it takes time. But I, 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 that I don't think is a, a logistic problem. It means that, yeah, there were trips. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can you say a little bit more about number three? It strikes me that, that a lot of this method is about teacher showing student and... I'm wondering if there's a way to kind of get so, yeah, so that get was a lot away of, from... That is a lot of what, what, what I tried to do in this course. You can ask you afterwards whether we, we succeeded. But um, there are, I think, many tools, especially digital tools, that can help clarify. I, I care very much about this, especially the literary reading part. right? And I, I refer to a little bit like not reading literally, not just opening, certainly not a micro gedolo, but even a Tanakh. And just reading straight, but like using computers to break down the text in a way so I can like that reading of Rav Amon Bazaka. I can say um, I, I can give them the the, se the the section, and I can say find the parallels. I can give those two sections and say find the parallels, and then I'm giving them access to those pieces of evidence either before or after I explain the theory. But yeah, that is critical, and I think there's a lot of things you can do that, especially when you when you use digital texts. And you can create the structure of the chapter in the structure of the... Then there's a lot you can do there. Um, and, uh, and there's tools like uh, Alatora, which has a word finder, where you click on one word and it highlights all the words, or it shows you the number of appearances. That's just a, a straight quantitative reading. What word appears the most? Good. Now, if, you highlight, if, I give, if I give, and I think you could do this in lower school also, you give someone text, either on computer or not on computer, find all the, find all the people. Find all the verbs. Okay, now look for this specific, you set it up, you have to scaffold it in a way that makes sense. You have to build it over time, but there's so many elements to reading that are not read linearly and translate that, le like if you understand, this, this I think is sort of the main point. If you understand what we mean by literary reading as opposed to just reading, then you have so many more opportunities for clarifying what the, re how, do you, how do you do that reading? And you can isolate them. You can isolate a, a reading of two psukim, of ten psukim, of a unit, or of multiple chapters in a way that is accessible to students. Yeah. Just a quick I wrote. Um, I, I just want to point out, you, you, you uh, indicated that the literary method has uh, precedence and it wasn't invented by Herzog. That's true for the realia, too. Uh, of course, 100%. Your, of course. Your realia used the source from the Middle Ages. Correct. As it's of, course. Right. of course. Uh, and also, the Masha Karamu, Masha Katu, they're also, I, I, you said this, I just want to point out that um, those also obviously don't have to contradict each other. On the contrary, as you quoted from, uh, from Menachem, if, if Mashikara and Mashikatuv are not exactly the same, then, mash, then I have to understand what Mashikatuv is trying to tell me. Right. And I only understand that when I realize that Mashikara the only The conflict, I'd say, or the issue that, that you have as teachers is where do you spend your time? Right? Right. Like the biggest excuse, the most important issue, the biggest excuse, whatever, there's no time. There's no time for anything, right? Obviously, there's no time for anything. Good. There's no time. What do you care about? You're going to do that. You're going to spend time on the things that you care about. Is it worth it spending the time going through the maps? That's the question. It's it's a lot, it's a lot of time to prepare, and it's hard for the students. Is it worth it? 
And my answer is, well, that depends what you care about. If you care about breaking out of this magical mode, and if you care about at least some of your students understanding a logistical, um, practical, like this really happened, kind of, then it's worth it. Then spend the time to do that. Maybe not every year. Maybe think about that's something that should happen. Perfect. That's sixth grade. Sixth grade should be all about maps. I don't know. Build your... Someone, some point, is going to build a 12-year curriculum that's going to stage these skills in a way that makes sense. I'm sure, I'm positive, it's going to happen, and that should be part of it from a, from a young age. Yes? So really what you might want to add is to find your context first, then go to find a Herzog idea, then identify my Five, Yeah. Well, so, you know what? I know. <laughs> the, yes, and I'd say the, 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 the struggle as a teacher, and, and I, I guess I, right. this point I should make also, this is not a one-time thing. You don't right. do this once. Right. You're constantly thinking about this, but you at least start with that. Sure. And then you adjust it as you go along. Correct. You also then, don't always get to choose your context. You might correct. You mandate, and then you can exactly. make it exciting. Yeah. Even though we know that once you're in the classroom, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I was going to just answer your question. I, this, after our class, I actually with my lowest track, who really, they don't understand Hebrew. Um, low, um, it's lowest track no, in high level. school. Um, I have a <coughs> for um, Korah, the Korah Rebellion, and just had them looking for, like, they all know what, like, Vayomer is, and who and when to highlight who is speaking to who when. And on their own, they pretty much divided and t were able to divide and um, titled the parak, even though it, they didn't understand the parak, but they were able to get that piece. With they came to it on their own, and they realized that the rebellion was two different rebellions and not just one. Wow! And it was a low track. Who, anytime I even put a word of Hebrew, like we don't understand Hebrew. Yeah, I just paid her a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Next, uh, yeah. next uh, session in that.